Good afternoon, uh, good morning, depending where you are. Uh, I am Dr. Mojen Sengimana. 
uh, Secretary General of African Organization for Standardization. Yeah. I will once be with you uh, to moderate uh, today's webinar, uh, which is a very, very interesting topic uh, on mutual recognition arrangement and trade facilitation. Uh, we have been discussing uh, different topics since last year uh, in order to understand uh, how the quality infrastructure work, but how the quality infrastructure can actually uh, play its role in the implementation of the African continental free trade area. Today we will focus on equivalence. If I talk equivalence, I'm talking about equivalence in technical regression and the mutual recognition in the free trade agreement, establishing a continental framework to address the African divergence regulatory system for trade in the AFCFTA single market. Uh, we have uh, different speakers. I will introduce them as uh, they uh, take uh, the, their presentation. Uh, but I would like to specify that the main objective of today if you look at um, the movement of goods and service of movement of product within a single market, the main key issue is mutual recognition uh, towards uh, using one standard, one test, and one certificate that, that is accepted everywhere. Uh, we would like to see, we will see the presentation of uh, the continental body, AFRAC, uh, the role of AFRAC, what, what is AFRAC is doing at the continental level, we will see at the national level, the Kenya accreditation. Uh, we will see also the, some impact on mutual recognition within the regional economic communities and at the national level. Uh, the, the, we would like to, at the end of this presentation, that our participant become aware on the importance of quality infrastructure, the importance of the mutual recognition, and they understand also uh, the provision that we have under the AFCFTA, under the WTO TBT agreement, and actually also touch on some more technical regression issues. I welcome you once again to this uh, webinar. I am looking forward to learn more with you, participant coming from all over Africa and outside Africa. I would like to welcome our first speaker. Our first speaker is uh, Mr. Mahmoud El Tiab, uh, who is uh, presenting on behalf of um, uh, AFRAC because he is the AFRAC mutual recognition arrangement vice president uh, is also a convener of Af AFRAC evaluators working group. Uh, Mahmoud has a long, very long experience. Actually, he started uh, working in quality infrastructure in 1976. Before MEM, the African organization, uh, uh, before the African organization, for standardization um, uh, was established. Uh, he works as a, a calibration engineer. Uh, he also worked as a quality assurance expert in the government institution till 2005. Then he joined the Egyptian Accreditation Council in 2006 as an accreditation director then he rose to a position of executive director until 2013. Uh, you can see his, has uh, the information on the accreditation, has the knowledge uh, to tell us about the accreditation on the continent, as he has also worked actually not just for AFRAC, but he has been also the chair of Arab Accreditation Corporation from 2013 to 2018. Uh, welcome Mah Mahmoud, 
LTAB, uh, you can give your presentation and you can share your slide. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. And I uh, have the honor to, uh, to, uh, to participate with you in, uh, uh, in uh, this event. And uh, I would like to give you also the greeting from Mr. Ron Josias, who is the AFRAC chair and his apology to attend with us as he has another event at uh, bland evening at the same time. Uh, I will uh, now um, start with you the first presentation about uh, overview of the uh, AFRAC uh, uh, range. Uh, this I cannot share because if the host, um, it's written here that host disabled participant screen sharing. So if, if you can allow me to share the uh, presentation. Done. Yeah, now it's okay. Okay. Is it clear now? Yes, it is clear. Please okay. go ahead. Mm. Okay, uh, I will. I will start with giving you and uh, just um, uh, a quick view on uh, AFRAC in the international accreditation system because this is an important issue uh, for the how the uh, arrangements are working at the uh, regional and at. Uh, the international level. Uh, if we look at the bottom of this slide, we can imagine thousands of conformity assessment buses in each field of conformity assessment. Their role is to ensure the quality of product services provided uh, to local customers or moved across the borders. Uh, but who will ensure uh, and assess the competence uh, of these conformity assessment body and the quality of the services they provide. It is the role of the national accreditation bodies at the national level to ensure the competence of these conformity assessment bodies through accreditation, because accreditation actually means to ensure the technical competence of conformity assessment bodies in specific fields. Then who will evaluate the competence uh, who will evaluate the competence of national accreditation bodies to perform their role? It is the role of the regional cooperation. Uh, the re it is the role of the regional cooperation bodies, what we call it, the re what we call them the regions, through the peer evaluation mechanism. Through the peer evaluation mechanism, uh, they evaluate the national accreditation body, and we have six regions including AFRAC to cover the world. Uh, then who will evaluate the competence of these regions um, to perform their work and to recognize them? It is the role of ILAC and IF. Normally ILAC is working in the area for testing, calibration, medical testing, inspection, reference material producer, proficiency testing provider, while IF is working in the area of all kinds of certification. This system, if we look at the whole system here, it is like a pyramid. It's based in the thousands of conformity assessment buses accredited, and at the top is only two organizations, which are ILAC and IF. ILAC and IF define the same requirements that are used in consistent manner by all regions and by national accreditation bodies for accreditation system of conformity assessment body. Let us think if we have similar systems with the same inputs, then we expect similar outputs. What is the output of conformity assessment bodies? For example, for testing labs, it is the testing certificates for products. So we can expect that any product tested by accredited lab in one location will have the same results if tested by another accredited lab in other location, once both of them are covered by ILAC MRA. This is the main objective of international system of accreditation, 
that accredited ones and accepted everywhere. This is the main objective. This means that we accept the results of conformity assessment bodies covered by ILAC and IAF arrangement and located at other side of the border with no need to repeat the conformity assessment activity. This helps to remove the technical barriers to trade and to enhance trade uh, across the borders. This is the main objective and how is this international accreditation system works and the position of a track uh, in this international accreditation system. Now we need to uh, look quickly at the role of AFRAC arrangement to, facil to facilitate trade. AFRAC is the cooperation of accreditation bodies, sub-regional accreditation cooperations, and the stakeholders whose objective is to provide internationally recognized and accepted accreditation support to industry, trades, and to contribute to protection of health and safety and the environment. Then it's facilitate trade and contributing to improvement of Africa competitiveness within the global market. Uh, AFRAC MRM was launched in 2014 and has been internationally recognized by ILAC and IF since May 2018, which enables for the full integration of Africa into the world trading system. AFRAC is working in harmony with ILAC and IF to support world trade by eliminating technical barriers, realizing the free trade goal of accredited ones and accepted everywhere, as explained in my previous slide. The international recognition of AFRAC MRA should be utilized to be the basis for acceptance of conformity assessment results in both the voluntary and regulatory domain. And this is an important issue that in AFRAC, we ask all to use the AFRAC arrangement uh, for the acceptance of conformity assessment results across the borders. Eliminating redundant conformity assessment, increasing intra-African trade in framework of AFCFTA and the ease of access to regional and international markets are the key advantages of recognized AFRAC MRA. Now, just I give you a short update on AFRAC arrangement. AFRAC arrangement now at the moment um, um, is increasing and um, there is an encouraging signs for uh, membership of AFRAC. The current status of members in terms of membership category, uh, we have arrangement members, which are six. Uh, we are uh, have six uh, arrangement members. We have four members uh, with uh, five members. Then we have one associate member and we have 13 uh, stakeholders. At the moment, we don't have, at, at the beginning, we didn't have stakeholders. At the beginning, we start only by three uh, members, but you see now we are in progress with both the signs. Uh, now, what about the future of AFRAC MRA and the extension of recognized arrangement? A response to the a response of AFRAC to the demands of the markets within the continental, much effort has been made by AFRAC to extend the scope of recognition by ILAC and IF to include more conformity assessment activities. Because we start in the arrangement with some conformity assessment activities, then we extend the scope of MRA of AFRAC to include subscopes of management system certification in 2020. Then in 2021, actually we apply to ILAC and IF for, um, to include product certification, personal certification, reference material producers, proficiency testing providers, uh, and also some other subscopes for management system certification to include to the recognized arrangement. AFRAC has already been remotely evaluated by ILAC and IF in 2021. This evaluation has been started in February 2021, and the last activity was in August, just this month, uh, for um, re-evaluation of AFRAC to maintain the initial recognition and to extend the, the, the scope to include uh, such conformity assessment uh, activities. Uh, I understand that I have only 
five to seven minutes uh, to uh, make my presentation. And I hope uh, that I, I, I try uh, to make everything in those short five. Thank you Thank so you. much for your listening. Thank you, Mahmoud. Uh, thank you to use time wisely, uh, the, the, the time of uh, seven minutes as, uh, as suggested. It, just uh, Mahmoud, looking at your presentation, yeah, looking at the coverage that you have on the African continent, it, what, what is clearly uh, the role of AFRAC within the African continental free trade area? Uh, can we say that once, once you have all the, the map of Africa covered by, by your MRA, that's a product that can, can move, no, let's say a certificate given by accredited laboratory in Egypt. Yeah, it, it can be accepted by South Africa easily. Uh, yes, this is the main approach or this is the main objective of the accreditation system at the international level and for AFRAC at the regional level that accredited once and accepted where accepted everywhere as I explained now and if we look at the uh, AFC uh, FTA uh, annex um, uh, 6 uh, where it includes an in article 4 uh, the objective of this, of this uh, annex is uh, to, facil to facil facilitate trade through cooperation and standards, technical regulation, conformity assessment, accreditation, and metrology. I will talk about the accreditation part here. What efforts has been done by AFRAC to support this agreement? Uh, because if we look at the Article 9 of Annex uh, 6, it includes some, uh, some tools of uh, need cooperations in accreditation, and we'll see how AFRAC has responded to those requirements. It's written clearly in Article 9 that uh, for, to support this objective, of cooperation in, co in, in accreditation. For example, the first one is to encourage, encourage accreditation body to achieve international recognition. And this is what we happened. What happened? Actually, we start with three members um, at the beginning of establishing of AFRAC as arrangement members. Now we have six uh, arrangement members, and we are we have also five full members. Those five full members they are in the way of their evaluation to be an arrangement member. So we expect within the next few years to have more uh, of the uh, uh, arrangement members and um, to be encouraged to achieve the international recognition. Also, we see that one of those tools is to support the recognition of multi-economy accreditation bodies and support their focal points. And this is what we have now. Uh, SATCAS is now uh, recognized as a full uh, as a, a arrangement member of AFRAC, and it is evaluated by AFRAC, and now it is recognized by by AFRAC and uh, recognized by ILAC and DIAC, and uh, it supports uh, thirteen economies which does not which do not have any uh, accreditation body. Uh, and also their focal points are included with us during any awarenesses, during any training, during any uh, uh, activities within AFRAC, we include and encourage those sub supporting focal points because they promote the arrangement of AFRAC uh, through uh, other economies, which does not have uh, 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 local accreditation bodies. Thank you. Also, um, also, one of them is to coordinate, and we have liaise with uh, ILAC and IF. Actually, now AFRAC has a seat in the ILAC and IF Executive Committee and has a representative in, it, in all of the committees for ILAC and IF. This will give a chance uh, to promote our arrangement and give a chance to our national accreditation bodies to be internationally recognized and to have also a good chance to our conformity assessment bodies
to be covered by ILAC and IF arrangement, which facilitate the trade uh, within Africa and across the borders at the international level. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, looking forward to more work from Africa and uh, uh, covering the whole Africa. Thank you a lot. Uh, our next speaker is um, uh, Martin Chesire, uh, who is the managing director of the Kenya Accreditation Service. Is well known in the quality infrastructure um, network, as he also worked at the ISO, which is International Standardization Organization. Actually, is one of the qualified with uh, masters of science in quality management and business excellence uh, from University of uh, Stirling in Scotland. Uh, he has also executive master of business administration obtained from uh, uh, internet, the University of Geneva in Switzerland. Uh, Switzerland. Uh, Martin Cecile will discuss with us the role of accreditation bodies in establishing mutual recognition of conformity assessment results, which is a very, very hot topic. How can, can we accept the conformity assessment results on our continent. Yeah, meaning one standard, one test, one certificate. Uh, Martin, yeah, you can start sharing your presentation. You are welcome. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, good morning, those who have just woken up. Um, I will discussed uh, very briefly on mutual recognition and how we accreditation bodies um, support this and pursue this to ensure that we regulators, um, I hope it is visible. Yes, you on can a put on a slide show. Okay, just one second. Okay. And do you have also seven minutes? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Secretary General, um, colleagues across uh, Africa. Um, Harmonization or recognition of the prevalence of technical regulation. What is the role of accreditation bodies in establishing mission recognition uh, of conformity assessment results? I want to begin by uh, putting into context where the principle of mutual recognition began from. It began from um, a judicial case in the European Court, European Court of Justice in 1979 where uh, a regulation uh, that was held by the German government that puts uh, a monopoly in terms of uh, trade in spirits and puts a minimum alcohol content uh, to which uh, any other product should not exceed. And so when the French tried to bring in uh, their cream liquor, um, they, it was consumed and declared as an illegal product. And the, the, the European Court of Justice then determined and said, if the cream liquor is fit for the French and they're a legitimate member of the EU, then it is also fit for the Germans. So the German regulation was declared to have been um, occasioning a trade barrier. And as a result, the ruling demanded that uh, each country where a regulation prescribes certain requirements should be considered to be equivalent uh, of the other country. And that is where mutual recognition came about. So if it's fit for Kenyans, it should be fit for South Africans. And this is what we aspire with the AFCFTA to achieve. And this is what accreditation itself would want to realize. Um, the principle of Cassis Dijon has now been expanded beyond dealing with goods or products to even movement of, of persons and services. And I think they, this is where the window we should take advantage 
in the context of Annex 6, where accreditation bodies play a bigger role uh, to support the achievement of free movement of goods across Africa. Uh, putting uh, putting uh, for those who are new, um, accreditation today um, basically is a third party independent recognition of competency, partiality, and performance capability of any organization that provides services for certification, verification, inspection, uh, testing, or calibration. It is today uh, a proven tool to deliver universal confidence. Um, as uh, my colleague mentioned, uh, under the International Board Accreditation Corporation and the International Accreditation Forum, uh, it is recognized among one, one, one of three countries. So that means conformity assessment results that are coming out from accredited bodies are recognized in 103 countries. And I think the number is still uh, keeps growing. Uh, we also view accreditation as particularly for the, for the context of regulators as the other layer of assurance. Uh, how would you trust a laboratory's results? Who would check the laboratory? Uh, and that's why sometimes you hear in the world of accreditation, we talk about uh, the checking of checker or the checker of checkers. Accreditation bodies are the checkers of checkers. And given the background of the Cassis Dijon, um, ISO, the International uh, Organization for Standardization, as well as the International uh, Electric Commission, concluded um, a set of uh, documents to help create mutual recognition arrangements or frameworks. Um, in the standard, uh, there are two standards, ISO Guide 68, which is still valid until today, and ISO 17040. Um, that are still valid. Uh, we're hoping revisions are coming up. And they define how such arrangements can happen. And in, in, in this context, how the sub-regional groups within Africa can also explore around on the lower level of conformity assessment body to conformity assessment body mutual recognition. Um, and, and, and this becomes the basis to which uh, regulators should be able to see how they are supported by not only accreditation, and how they can take advantage and use the results of conformity assessment bodies. Now, in context, just to give uh, symbolism or illustrate uh, the scenario, the regulators define the law and the rules and the regulations. It is government to government. And this we believe within the African Union, that's where country A and country B um, are the regulators, they prescribe requirements. And if the requirements are then prescribed, and we take the principle of mutual recognition, uh, a designated accreditation body or recognized accreditation body in country A can accredit a testing facility, uh, an inspection body, certification body to test. The net effect is at the end of it, the bottom line is the test reports or inspection reports, the management certification or products are certified can be traded without any duplicative testing. Uh, this is the principle of how fast uh, we can be able to eliminate uh, unnecessary costs for the testing, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> certification, um, and make our goods trade. We are only talking about 15% inter African trade. We need to grow that, and, and I believe in the agenda 2063. The only basis, and I think this is what we take as a creation bodies, our role is to facilitate that, get the regulators. And uh, not to invent the wheel, but to use the mechanisms that are available. And if used effectively, um, and I think this has been demonstrated within the European Union, that you do not have to uh, reinvent if there is an accreditation body for testing water uh, in country A, uh, those results should be accepted in country B. Uh, just briefly to just uh, reflect. Um, from our, from Kenas and Accreditation Body. Kenas, as you can see in the map, is an arrangement number, as I mentioned by Mahmoud. Um, the question we raise is, is it a principle that we should have all the gaps filled? Uh, the question, my answer to that is yes and no. Uh, uh, the no part is, it is possible for other countries to accept the basis for the results to be accreditation. If they do so and they do not have an accreditation body, um, that then facilitates faster movements uh, of products. But yes, as we evolve towards uh, the future. 
Uh, and finally, um, the context of my presentation. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. <clears throat> was to harmonize or to recognize. I believe I have mentioned and I've clearly demonstrated that with respect to conformity assessment uh, results and the regulations, like in the Cassis de John case, Germany had a law or regulation that was dating way back in 1922. And the European Union at that point was trying to imagine how to approximate to be able to harmonize. Um, but this has not been achieved. They only harmonize in terms of uh, referring to standards or identifying essential requirements. Uh, so that means the normative components that are required for purposes of demonstrating conformity, conformity can be, uh, which I believe ARSO is currently doing, sub, uh, promoting uh, harmonization both within ARSO itself and the sub regional entities. But for conformity assessment, it is recognition. The, the proven tool of accreditation exists, and, and AFRAC exists, and AFRAC itself uh, has already demonstrated that from 2014. And it continues to pursue additional scopes for different sectors uh, to ensure that there is broader availability of accredited facilities and accreditation network within Africa. So to, to answer the question, mutual recognition uh, should be the basis at the accreditation point uh, without fail. Um, if we go at conformity assessment level, and I would want to give the case of ESC. In 2004, um, the National Standards Body within the region decided to have a, a peer uh, mechanism to recognize results, uh, which was by, established by regulation within uh, ESC. However, each time there is an issue, the question comes back, was the results of Tanzania or Kenya right? So accreditation has to be the basis because we are talking about <coughs> competence, impartiality, <coughs> and performance capability of any entity. So yes, countries can legitimately maintain their juridical system, their different regulatory regimes, but we must have an equivalence uh, anchored on mutual recognition as I've shown before, and as a mode of governance um, within Africa. With that, uh, Secretary General, I want to say thank you, Asante Sana. Uh, Asante, Asante Sana Martin. Uh, actually, uh, the case of Kasi do Dijon uh, that you mentioned, make me now uh, ask you a question. We have the mutual recognition agreements between the governments, government to government. We have the mutual recognition arrangement that is more voluntary. And we know that there are many countries do not have the accreditation bodies. Yeah, that's probably to, to have a mandated accreditation body to, to enter the mutual recognition arrangement uh, would not be feasible. I am linked to your last comment on peer review mechanism in East Africa. Or that you say that we should really be thinking about the accreditation uh, bodies. What, what do you think now we should do? Yeah, uh, should we go if government agree to go toward the mutual recognition agreements? Yeah, uh, as, as that case happened and the, the, between the, the French and the, the Germany, yeah, without any support of mutual recognition arrangements, which include accreditation. What do you think we, we should do as a, a African in East Africa or any example or countries in ECOWAS or other countries? Only SADC has an accreditation, a multi economy accreditation body. Okay. Um... Given the experience of East African community, and I think this is where um, I, I applaud um, SADC for creating um, a regional accreditation system. And not every economy can support accreditation. And so, given that we are clustered within sub regional entities, it is uh, where 
uh, there is an accreditation body. That accreditation body to, to propagate and have a regional uh, accreditation system where it is taken as the anchor accreditation body and then it supplies and trains uh, assessors within the countries that don't have an accreditation body. And those countries then accept um, the accreditation by the lead accreditation body or eventually go the Sadaka's way where it is a full uh, re regional accreditation uh, body covering multiple, multiple economies. What we are thinking for us um, uh, as Kenas, uh, because we have the technical expertise uh, to provide the East African Community Secretariat with technical um, um, uh, expertise to be able to uh, reconstruct um, the accreditation cooperation within ESC, uh, thereby then supply uh, and the bigger resource that is consumed in, in accreditation is availability of assessors uh, that becomes very expensive when you fly out an assessor and back. So have the resources available, have the national focal points working. Uh, I'm encouraged, for example, what the West African are doing, and I think they'll be moving towards uh, fully having a regional. And for others within the northern part of, of, of Africa, I think we have uh, Tunisia and within the Mercosur area, they could also uh, try and create, I think that would be an easier way to go than to expect every country to install full accreditation. And that becomes the basis in where a country says we will base, we will accept uh, accredited conformity assessment uh, results rather than uh, saying, let us do all differently. Thank you. So Thank you very much. Capacity building has to come around it and perhaps a development context has to be built in. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Multi-economy accreditation is key. Uh, not every country can afford actually to have an accreditation body and a sustainable one. That is very, very important. Thank you, Martin. Our, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Mukai Musarwa. He's currently the TBT quality infrastructure expert uh, in Comesa. Uh, Musarwa is also well known by the quality infrastructure system uh, in Africa, is a, high, a highly qualified and skilled consultant uh, on quality issues in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, he has worked on uh, quality policies, he has worked on technical regulation, he has actually uh, uh, knowledge on uh, SPS and TBT issues. Uh, today, he will be speaking uh, to us the trade effects of uh, MRAs for the import and export inspection and the certification systems, uh, where uh, Musarwa will focus on benefits, costs, challenges, and opportunities, and the success factors and the alternative with the experience he has in Comesa. Uh, Dr. Musarwa, you have also seven minutes. Uh, you can share from your site uh, your presentation to be able to uh, manage the time. Thank you. Dr. Musarwa. Thank you very much, <clears throat> um, uh, moderator. And um, very good afternoon, good morning, good evening depending on where you are on the globe, you know, and again, you know, uh, as Comesa, we just want to uh, appreciate the invitation to uh, make a presentation and to share our experiences uh, with respect to uh, the area of uh, mutual recognition uh, agreements and the model that we follow uh, as a, a rec in uh, approaching the subject, subject matter. Uh, next one, please. So as uh, indicated by the moderator, we'll just look at uh, the you know, uh, rationale of the uh, mutual recognition agreement uh, from our perspective, you know, in sub region. Uh, we'll also look at the commercial model. Then uh, again, the both benefits versus the costs and then the challenge, some of the challenges. And again, you know, end up with a look at um, some of the success factors, you know, and uh, and and so forth. Uh, next one, please. 
I think the key thing really sort of to understand from the rationale we have heard from uh, Mr. Chesirian, you know, on the Cassidy John, uh, which is a very good example of uh, the bed of uh, 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 MRIs and their application. Of course, now there are several other, you know, successful models which are being implemented, particularly in, uh, you know, developed economies. Uh, but from our perspective, uh, as we are all aware that you know uh, uh, TBTs and the SPS, you know agreements of the WTO, they do permit countries, you know, to uh, impose technical standards to protect their populations and so forth. But I think the key issue is that you know this has to be done within certain rules and disciplines, so that you know we do not, you know, uh, in the process of doing that, create unnecessary you know barriers to trade. So uh, we know also that you know both agreements do you know espouse equivalence and mutual recognition agreements, and this is where we take our you know uh, you know uh, take from uh, in terms of the application. Uh, again, you know we have had you know that these enable conformity assessments, you know testing, inspection, and certification, you know to you know, for specified products intended for export to the other party's territory or to be undertaken in the country of export. And this then has that key effect of uh, reducing non-tariff, you know, technical and regulatory barriers to trade uh, between countries. Again, the main aim of MRIs from our perspective, of course, is to promote trade liberalization and economic cooperation uh, between the core signatories, you know, to these arrangements. Next, please. Next slide, please. All right. So just moving quickly then to the Comesa, you know, uh, mutual recognition framework and mutual recognition agreement model. Uh, this is just a slide which um, shows a pilot that we carried out in 2017 to 2018. Uh, in uh, six countries, and we were looking at maize and maize products. And uh, we then developed what we call a mutual recognition framework uh, as an initial uh, tool uh, or an annex to the mutual recognition agreement itself, which is more or less a, a political you know, document or a policy document or a statement. Uh, but the actual technical issues are then embedded in this mutual recognition framework. And it comprised you know, about five key pillars. Uh, those you can see there, a common grading criteria, which included you know, the SOPs themselves, a sampling protocol, you know, uh, a PT scheme you know, on our fractoxin, and then you know, this recognition of the certificates of analysis, uh, as well as you know, issues relating to method validation. Next one, please. So, uh, the issue is what are the problems, you know, that we're trying to resolve uh, with, you know, using this uh, mechanism of uh, MRAs. Uh, we know that MTBs are the most significant constraint on the growth of um, intra rec trade. And uh, we know also now that SPS and TBT issues are estimated to account for over 70% of NTBs. Uh, in our region, you know, uh, especially. We know that, you know, we have cumbersome procedures that are faced by traders, you know, obtaining SPS documents, certificates and other documents in order to process, you know, transactions. There's also the issue of the multiplicity of SPS TBT agencies at the borders, especially, which result in duplication, overlaps, unpredictability and increased costs and often lead to the use of non-formal crossing routes. You know, we have done a lot of, you know, uh, border related, you know, um, work, which have provided a lot of evidence relating to this particular issue. We do also have differences in quality and conformity assessment measures, which again result in regulatory, you know, technical barriers to trade. There are issues which speak to lack of mutual recognition of technical regulations and conformity assessment. Hence why we have this webinar series today we have different grading systems and results between local laboratories, private sector entities, uh, and then leading to mistrust in the acceptance and rejection criteria 
on cons on consignments. Again, coming from non-harmonized, you know, uh, uh, sampling and grading, you know, procedures. The issue of visual trust and confidence amongst regulators is a major problem, and we found out that when we did the pilot, and this was one of the things that we focused our attention on in addressing the issue of uh, uh, key factors relating to MRIs. Again, the issue of non-harmonized SPS measures, regulations, standard operating procedures, very, very problematic. Again, and lastly, the lack of capacity capability mechanism for risk-based methods, uh, you know, relating to surveillance, sampling, you know, testing, inspection, and so forth. Next one, please. I won't, you know, uh, go on to this because this is just a, a bit more detail on the problem itself, but again, really, really trying to highlight the key problems that uh, we face in the areas of, um, you know, activities and SPS, uh, and hence why MRAs are necessary as a tool to, uh, you know, uh, uh, redress these problems. Next one, please. Well, um, the point that I wanted to emphasize also is that in developed economies, mutual recognition agreements are easier to design and implement, given, of course, the fact that they've got advanced quality infrastructure systems, issues of mutual trust and confidence in each other's systems do not really, you know, arise. Uh, and, uh, you know, um, the, MRIs themselves would, in fact, even embed the technical details as annexes, you know, uh, in the in the in the same document. In our environment, though, we have a deep, bit of a difference. We have lack of trust and confidence in each other's systems due to varied capabilities and competencies, especially in our quality infrastructure systems. So the approach that we adopted after a lot of, you know, uh, you know, thinking outside the box a lot of interrogating a lot of issues uh, was to then firstly elaborate a mutual recognition framework, which would spell out the technical building blocks of the mutual recognition agreement itself and the requirements. And then secondly, to then move on down the line to the actual you know, policy document, which is the mutual recognition agreement, which is normally signed you know, by the politicians you know, uh, at whatever, you know, level, uh, and then hence the key problem area that we focused most of our attention on was the mutual recognition framework, what we termed the mutual recognition framework. Uh, and the point though to note is that the mutual recognition, you know, framework underpins and forms the basis upon which then those countries which are participating can elaborate and implement the mutual recognition agreement are for trade in whatever commodities they wish to uh, trade on. So, so this is, I think, a very something clear that we need to understand about the mutual recognition framework. Next one, please. Again, just showing, you know, uh, grammatically the, you know, uh, uh, the mutual recognition framework pillars uh, that we saw earlier on. We have those, uh, the manual, you know, sampling manual, you know, uh, you know, on the protocol also uh, incorporating the standard operating procedures. We then developed the PT scheme in you know, technical training. Uh, the PT scheme was obviously because we were dealing with maize, it was on uh, aflatoxins, and that was the major SPS issue in terms of trade amongst you know, those six countries that I mentioned earlier on. We then have, you know, uh, because we're dealing with maize, again, put in place a common grading criteria given the different standards that were being used, especially between EAC, uh, Comesa member states, uh, and those in the southern part of, uh, 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 of the continent, in Southern Africa, the Zambia, the Zimbabwe, and Malawi. Uh, and, uh, you know, so this was very, very uh, important. And we then grouped these pillars as the key elements of the mutual recognition framework itself and, uh, you know, did a lot of, you know, capacity building uh, and a lot of work, you know, in that area. Next one, please. Again, this just explains, you know, those, you know, pillars that I've spoken about, you know, why we then had a risk-based common aflatoxin sampling protocol, uh, which would then allow consistency in the monitoring of contamination uh, along the value chain and improve 
the reliability of an analytical results. We all know very well that no matter how good equipment you have, first class, you know, analysts, if you get your sampling wrong, everything else, you know, is just useless. You know, we then develop those harmonized standard operating procedures. Uh, again, in the normal, you know, parameters, your moisture, your broken grains, you know, following the standards, you know, again, you know, uh, to enable the um, cross-border inspectors to objectively assess, you know, uh, compliance. We had validated methods of analysis, a lot of, you know, technical training hands-on in the laboratories on, you know, how to conduct aflatoxin testing, whether it was using HPLCs, whether it was using your normal, you know, rapid test kits like your neogens, everything, you know, was done in that area. Uh, next one, please. So the lessons learned, I think, you know, just a simple table to show you, you know, what was, you know, the situation pre this, the commercial mutual recognition framework, what we did in terms of support, and then what, you know, where the benefits arising from that, you know, again, you know, very, very clear to see that, you know, uh, we had a reduction in terms of disputes and different laboratories, you know, again, accepting each other's results. We had, you know, enabled five laboratories to then extend their scope of accreditation into aflatoxin, you know, uh, in the region. Uh, we had a lot of you know, laboratory cooperation, which never used to happen before, you know, to the extent that, for example, in Kenya, you know, laboratories could actually even share reagents, laboratories, because the person, personnel had, you know, a lot of trust in each other uh, and, and, and could collaborate and cooperate you know, and so forth. So a lot of that, you know, came into being, and this is also very, very important when it comes to uh, uh, this issue of uh, mutual recognition. Next, please. Again, here, just trying to show the key stakeholders from governments, from regulators, to so private sector, you know, a lot of them and what are their, you know, different, you know, uh, roles and responsibilities, you know, uh, in the world setup of uh, mutual recognition agreements. The next one. Right, what are the benefits, you know, again, of an MRIF, you know, MRIA, again, very, you know, broad summary. It does assist in lowering cost to business and, um, you know, uh, improves competitiveness, you know, through lower compliant costs from harmonized procedures, conformity assessment regimes, and grading standards, you know, uh, you know. It also is an, an enabler for elimination of multiple conformity assessment tests. We've heard a lot about this. It is also provides an impetus for regulators to adopt good regulatory practices and eliminate and remove you know, unnecessary regulatory barriers uh, to change. It does build up mutual trust and confidence amongst the regulators in terms of their systems and competences. And I keep emphasizing on this because this is where the, most of the problems that we have you know, uh, uh, in the region. Does enhance cooperation between regulatory authorities in the region Again, it provides opportunities for scaling up and use of mutual recognition and equivalent agreements uh, within the uh, African continent of free trade area. So that's something that we need to talk about. In terms of course, again, it's quite resource intensive in the initial stages, you know, when you're doing the establishment, in terms of the technical specifications that you need to put in place, the standard operating procedures, the PT schemes, the technical capacity building, engagements, you know, buy-in of all the stakeholders, so initially there's that element of you know, cost involved. It does require a high level of commitment from the stakeholders, especially from the government, from the regulators. You know, we found out this you know, um, uh, uh, at the end, when we then try to do a bilateral agreement to be signed between the governments of Uganda and Kenya, you know, after doing all the hard technical work, you know, uh, 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 and we got a little bit stuck at that level. So, you know, this issue of commitment is something that, as a lesson, now we know that we need to. Kai, involve... can you can you summarize, please? Mm. Yes, sure. Thank you. Next one, please. So, the key success factors: the MRI, MRI design methodology tends to be commodity specific because of the issues that we deal with. Government put commitment, political will, which I've just mentioned, stakeholder commitment, the resource envelope needs to be there, mutual trust competence issues, technical competence, you know, again, conformity assessment issues, the national champions, you need national champions to drive this. Again, there are issues of digitization, you know, e-systems are coming in now, we need to keep abreast with that. 
issues of sustainability and, and, and so forth. Next one, please. Just concluding now. And again, you know, just to bring to the attention of everybody that we have a large project that we're carrying out together with our grant uh, as a follow up to the one that we completed in 2018. Well, in 2018, we didn't complete it because the funding envelope came to an end. So we have a big one that we are now doing with uh, a grant funding and uh, you know, also from the uh, foreign, foreign you know, um, development office uh, of UK aid, six member states. Now we are looking at four commodities, you know, we've, uh, you know upgraded. And uh, this is really uh, something that we are looking forward to. Uh, the, the outputs are there, I won't go through them. The last slide, I think is the next one now. <clears throat> next, please. Yeah, I mean, the concluding note, you know, from my side really is just to say, Without mutual recognition of technical standards and conformity assessment procedures, and equivalence of food control systems underpinned by mutually agreed standard operating procedures, multiple inspections and testing in the exporting and importing countries will persist and continue to cause an unpredictable regulated environment that comes at a high cost to businesses and small scale traders. Chair, I thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Makai. When I look at the, the, the presentation and uh, you emphasize on the trust, the trust that uh, we, we don't have. And actually, when you look at in the, the data that you have, uh, developed countries use more mutual recognition than developing countries. I go back to the Casido Dijon case that Martin presented and when he said that uh, if a French uh, person is drinking this, uh, why can't you drink it in the, the other country? Uh, it, it, it means, yes, we know we should protect our consumers, we should protect our population, but the trust is created. When I look at the example of aflatoxin, uh, that is one contaminant parameter that you focused on and build the capacity and probably is one of the biggest problem in a, a serious trend. It, it, you, you concluded with another project uh, with a graph. How sustainable do you think it is if we don't go towards really accreditation, if we are just continuing on, on a peer review, on a proficiency testing, how sustainable do you think this, uh, this can help uh, trade on a serious product within Comesa? Or, or you plan toward also having accreditation that provide also uh, the, the reviews, the reassessment after a certain period of time? Thank you. Yes, thank you for that uh, uh, question. I think if you uh, recall, I did mention uh, in uh, one of the slides that one major achievement that we had um, during the pilot that we carried out in 2017, 2018, was that five uh, laboratories and, and I can mention these, these are, you know, uh, uh, Kenya Bureau of Standards, uh, UNBS, uh, the Zambia Bureau of Standards, the Standards Association of Zimbabwe, and uh, the Rwanda Standards Board, were actually able to then extend their accreditation scope to include other toxins on the basis of the PT scheme that we supported them on. The key thing was not just, you know, supporting uh, the scheme itself, but then the total package that came with that, you know, uh, envelope, which was the, you know, capacity building, uh, uh, where in fact, after each round, we'll then have an evaluation workshop to evaluate the performance of each laboratory and to assess what, you know, uh, again, were the causes of, uh, say, poor performance uh, of some of the laboratories. And we then put in place, you know, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, various you know capacity building measures including even hands-on uh, training on how to conduct a proper 
you know, uh, analysis for aflatoxins, how to sample properly, you know, and, 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 and so forth and so forth. You know, so it was a very uh, intensive exercise over those, you know, I think it was about 15 months and, and which then at the end of the day assisted, you know, these laboratories to gain accreditation. And through that, to that we are not excluding accreditation, you know, in, in terms of, you know, that mutual trust. It is part and parcel of that mutual trust, you know, and, and uh, it should also be one of the outputs uh, that we aim for uh, in the MRIs, you know, that we develop. Uh, but, but as you know very well, you know, sometimes, unfortunately, uh, what tends to happen is that even with those um, um, technical aspects in place, we still do run into uh, politically motivated, if I might call them that, you know, issues, and, and hence why also we need to bring in the uh, policy aspect, the political aspect, that then mutual recognition is anchored, you know, in um, national policy uh, 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 frameworks, if you want to call them that, you know, but really, as I said, accreditation is, you know, a must, it's part and parcel of this, and hence why we also emphasized it uh, in the project that we had. It is also, in fact, um, a key area in the current project that we are implementing with, um, uh, with Agra. Uh, these are issues of um, ensuring that, you know, the project at the end of the day, the outputs themselves are sustainable and how best to do that than to have accreditation as one of the key issues which addresses mutual trust and mutual confidence, you know, amongst uh, regulators. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Doctor. Thank you very um, much. I see that, as you said, the capacity building, uh, focusing on commodity-based or parameter-based, uh, looking at probably the impact of that contaminant on, on cross-border trade is very key. And uh, lastly, as you said, uh, engaging in the political arena is, is also very important. Yeah, the government, uh, as on your slide on the stakeholders, the government also should be involved, the private sector should be involved. That is very, very important. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Musawa. Uh, our next speaker Thank is uh, Dr. Evga Zipwa, uh, who is uh, the Director General of Standard Association of Zimbabwe and uh, immediate past president of the African Organization for Standardization. Uh, Evga Zikwa has a huge experience in equality infrastructure. He has been in uh, ISO and uh, ARZO Council, and uh, he has actually even worked uh, uh, with the private sector in Zimbabwe. Uh, he knows the area of uh, standardization, the area of uh, conformity assessment, the area of accreditation, as he also worked uh, closely in developing the quality infrastructure in SADC. Uh, he will, she will be discussing with us uh, the mutual recognition arrangement among ARZO members, uh, for the recognition of the results of the conformity assessment procedure and the technical regulation to facilitate trade in Africa under the AFCFTA agreement, as uh, she is the ARZO champion on mutual recognition, uh, together with uh, uh, Rwanda, uh, Raymond Mo Morenzi, and uh, uh, Ghana, uh, Prof. Alex Dudo. Uh, Dr. F. Gazikwa, uh, you can share your presentation. You have seven minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, a very good afternoon to you all, uh, my dear brothers and sisters across the whole uh, continent. Um, Dr. Imogen, please confirm you can see my presentation. Uh, you can put on slideshow. Yes, we can see it. Yeah. 
Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. So um, I suppose I should prefix my presentation by saying, you know, coming at the end of uh, such great speakers, it is always difficult, but you have made my work very easy in the sense, in the sense that you have um, provided enough, uh, you know, um, I should down of, of some of what I wanted to say already. So I just want to acknowledge uh, and, and to thank you, uh, Dr. Himojin, and also the speakers, uh, Mahmoud, uh, my brother Martin Kenya, and also my other brother Mukai. Thank you so much um, for, for laying the foundation of my short presentation. I'll try and keep it uh, short. And as I said, um, because most of what I wanted to say has been experiences in Zimbabwe as the Zimbabwe champion of mutual recognition uh, so um, that was the lineup of uh, what I was going to be talking about. Um, I think much of which has been said, the heat, heterogeneous, um, you know, um, say outlook of our quality infrastructure and the regulatory frameworks. You know, I'll just discuss also uh, cooperation in conformity assessment under the F AFCFTA, mutual acceptance of results, how Zimbabwe has dealt with that, giving our own uh, perspective, MRA, quality infrastructure, cooperation um, under AFRAC, I like AF, and I'll speak a little bit about our CBCA uh, program. But before I go into my uh, next slide, I just wanted to say, listening to all of you, what is coming out very clearly is the fact that, um, you know, it all starts at national level, uh, where we have, where we are expected to have a national quality infrastructure. And also we are expected to, to have a, at least a national standardization strategy that is at a national level. And then the next level, of course, is the bilateral arrangements that we have between our countries, for instance, Zimbabwe, Botswana, Zimbabwe, Kenya, et cetera. And then the multilateral arrangements uh, and, and uh, you know, to Mukai's point to say, he was giving us an example of the you know, um, arrangements, the mutual uh, recognition framework and uh, agreements uh, within the Comesa region. And then we have the African context. So I think we have to have that at the back of our heads to say as countries, that is the, 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 you know, the building block uh, when we are thinking about all these things. So talking to our Zimbabwe, I'm borrowing from my brother in Kenya, uh, Kase de, 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 de Dijon. So we're moving from Kase de Dijon, and now we're going into peanuts, horticulture, cotton, sugar. You know, Zimbabwe is predominantly a, an agricultural country. Uh, so as I was preparing this presentation, what I was thinking about is, um, the issues around equivalents and MRAs, how are they been used in supporting Zimbabwe's agro-business? Because we are an agricultural country. And then what are some of the potential uh, TBTs and what solutions have we uh, actually, you know, um, you know, try to come up with? So speaking to this slide, um, I'll just speak in general terms because I don't have lots of time, only given seven minutes. Um, Really, I think as Zimbabwe, we recognize that um, you know there is an anticipated challenge of standards and conformity assessment in implementing TFTA due to the heterogeneous of our African states as we try and trade across the borders. And as Zimbabwe, who are we trading with? Our major trading partner, of course, is South Africa, but we also do have trade with Botswana, with Zambia. Malawi, et cetera, you know, we heard about the aflatoxins. Yes, we do trade with Malawi. Potential for, uh, you know, um, peanuts between Zimbabwe and Malawi, Kenya, EU, USA, uh, UAE. These are some of the countries that we're already trading with. And of course, when it comes to harmonization, um, you know, the WTO, we've already heard how it encourages harmonization, uh, the use of equivalence and mu mutual recognition um, you know, between, um, you know, in the bilateral free trade agreements and also under the AFCFTA. That is the, the, the major 
framework that has been built for us by WTO. And this is based on the fact that even when standards uh, in different countries have harmonized, the free flow of trade is inhibited by products. Uh, if products are subjected to redundant testing and certification requirements in multiple export markets. I mean, we have seen this happening where perhaps Zimbabwe is trying to export to Botswana, and then uh, they hit a brick wall because Botswana says, no, 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 no. Yes, uh, this has been tested, it has been certified, but then we are going to request for another test. So these are real problems where we need to harmonize our, our regimes. So, um, so the reason for harmonization, as we have already seen, is um, why it is so effective is that trading partners, uh, they, they should really face no ambiguity in understanding uh, another country's rules and conformance systems. But in reality, we know that that is really not the case. The, case, the, 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 the reality on the ground is very different when you start to trade, because this is where you find now, um, you know, some of our private sector players who come back to us to say, hey, this product was already tested and certified by SARS, but we are experiencing some of the uh, challenges. Um, and, um, you know, the issue of trust, of course, it becomes a, a, a major issue. Why is there a trust problem? Because countries have got a responsibility through the governments to identify areas where we need, where they need to protect humans, protect plants, and also animals as well. And then in terms of cooperating, in terms of uh, conformity assessment, this is an important area where under the uh, AFCFTA, Zimbabwe has already ratified. We recognize the fact that this is a, a, a key area where we will be looking um, as, the, as the champion for uh, mutual recognition agreements uh, under Africa, how we can support our private sector players to be able to, to actually trade. And also, um, you know, the issue of mutual accept, acceptance of results, we know that um, uh, Article 6.3 that has been spoken about, this is the basis on which the MRA is going to be, uh, you know, become a reality where we are saying we need one, one standard, one test, one certificate accepted everywhere. And uh, we are moving toward that. And as far as what have we done, we do have MOUs that we've read, MOUs that we have signed as the national standards body with countries in SADC. Uh, um, you know, we've got an MOU with uh, SUBS, with BOBS, with ZABS, KEBS, uh, um, and also with ASTM. And why did we sign these MOUs? Is because we recognize the fact that we need to cooperate in terms of our technical, um, you know, to be able to trade, uh, you know, with, with these countries. And um, at, at the level of the national standards bodies, we are finding ways and means to cooperate uh, in terms of standardization. And this has helped us quite a lot, especially when we run into problems through, uh, you know, some of our private sector players we, we always uh, resort to talking to our friends across the border to assist us. And just note all the pictures that I've got there. Zimbabwe, we are producing honey. And as you know, with honey, there are issues sometimes when you're trying to export your, uh, your, your, your honey across into another country. This is where the MRAs become extremely important uh, so that we, we, we can actually export our honey out of, out of Zimbabwe. You will get all the slides. And I think the issue of equivalence, I will not talk to it uh, a lot. Um, you know, it's a, it has already been spoken to, but just to, 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 to say that one of the, the conditions is typically on agreed processes, agreed procedures, and, um, you know, to determine that equivalence that we're speaking about. And how do we arrive at this equivalence? It's really um, equivalence may be determined through the assessment of each system against a set of agreed um, protections and um, may use international standards as a basis as well. And I think Mukai, you covered um, this area quite a lot. And uh, Mahmoud, thank you so much for, for explaining all of this as well as uh, Martin in terms of accreditation. Uh, we have been leveraging quite a lot on our accreditation. This is one area that I believe there's still room for, for us to, to, to increase the scope of accreditation. Um, for instance, uh, you know, with Zimbabwe, we are accredited for most of the trade, including the food safety as well. Zimbabwe, we are a leather, uh, leather country, so we hope that this is another area that we can leverage on. 
Uh, cooperation, yes. Um, since we are offering accredited uh, uh, certification, um, you know, for QMS, EMS, food, food, etc. Uh, you know, the basis uh, of international recognition of our of our certificates is on the, you know, the ILAC AF um, mutual agreements, mutual uh, signatory agreements that that are already in place with SATCAS because we are um, actually accredited by SATCAS um, under the multi-economy accreditation body. Um, this slide here it really talks to our CBCA program, which is our consignment-based conformity assessment program. I think Kenya calls it PIVOC. This is our local PIVOC, uh, where we are actually, um, you know, our, our, our the, the company, the, sorry, the organizations, or should I say, uh, countries that want to import, export their products, export their products into Zimbabwe, uh, they will be subjected to this uh, program, um, uh, where you know their accredited accredited certifications will be recognised by the Zimbabwe government, and uh, we do have uh, a Beru Veritas that has been um, uh, subcontracted by the government of Zimbabwe, um, and the categories of uh, products include food and agriculture includes building and civil engineering, timber, uh, petroleum and fuel, packaging materials, electrical and electronic uh, products, body care, ETC, ETC. All these products uh, actually have to be subjected to the CBCA program. Um, and as I said, the mutual recognition agreements through the accredited certification facilitates the, the importation of those products into Zimbabwe. And uh, that website, the uh, portal, um, there, if you visit that portal, you'll be able to see the full program, uh, how it operates in Zimbabwe. So as I uh, draw to a close, I um, just wanted to highlight some of the other areas um, that Zimbabwe is um, leveraging on besides our, our accredited certifications. We also are implementing the uh, EMA Ecomark Africa. This is under ASO uh, license, uh, where we are you know, actually certifying uh, to sustainable uh, sustainability standards for agriculture, forestry, and fisheries. And these are important areas for Africa to be able to trade and also Zimbabwe, because we are a big a timber exporter. Uh, and, and also with our fish, we do have our lake harvest where we are exporting that outside the country. And we are also exporting a lot of horticulture, especially to the EU. So I think in uh, just five minutes, I'd really try to, to, to go very fast. This is um, tea, this is a, a tea plantation. Uh, Zimbabwe, we're big tea drinkers. And um, you know, if you haven't tasted tea, we hope that you'll taste our Tanganda um, very soon. Um, by the way, one of my teas on the continent is the one from Kenya, it's called Kericho Gold. So thank you so much. Um, that this is my presentation, Secretary General, one who wants to get in touch with me. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gaziko. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your presentation. When, when you, you, you were presenting and um, where you even discuss about the existing MOUs, the MOUs that you have, uh, the, the mutual recognition that uh, agreements that the government of Zimbabwe entered with other countries. I, I was wondering, yeah, I, 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 we have many cases where these mutual recognition agreements are there, yeah. But if you ask now the private sector who should be using this opportunity, they are not gaining in a trade flow between the, the countries that signed the mutual recognition agreement. Why do you think these agreements are not working? Yeah, if it's just signing for signing, yeah, it's become a problem. Probably I link it to what Dr. Musarwa was talking about. Yeah, they, they, what can we do on the political side? if the document are signed, but our private sector, our industries cannot benefit from those signed documents. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Himogen. So, um, you know, I, I believe that part of it is, um, you know, lack of if information. One of the things that, uh, you know, these webinars have done 
um, on a very practical level is, is dissemination of information. If you look at everyone who's on this platform today, we are probably from the, most of us are prob probably from the, um, you know, TBT, quality infrastructure, you know, um, organizations. I think the message really is that we need to get this information to our private sector players um, so that they can leverage on it. That's, that's the first issue. And then the second issue is engagement uh, with our government, um, you know, our government stakeholders. For instance, our, our, our ministries, our regulators, our policymakers, our local authorities. We need to, to have similar engagements like the one that we've had today um, on a platform where they can also, um, you know, understand. I know as SARS, we've been doing these um, stakeholder engagements. Since the COVID started, we haven't been able to do face-to-face. -face. So we have moved on to these platforms to share this information and to, you know, to disseminate. Um, and then thirdly, I believe um, the, the, the point that I mentioned on the national quality policies, you know, our national quality policies uh, need to, to, to be such that um, they have been formalized to take into account the MRAs. Because once that is done and these um, uh, national quality policies are published, they become part and parcel of the way we should uh, do business um, you know, in our various countries, including Zimbabwe. Because I believe that without a, a proper framework, this is why I, I keep going to Mukai's MRA, MRF, MRA um, a pillar uh, presentation. That is the basis for MRAs. So this now needs to be, um, perhaps uh, it, it should find its way into the policy. And then this should be a basis on which governments should now understand that this is the framework that should work for Africa. And this is the framework that should work for even Zimbabwe or Kenya or Malawi. Um, I think once we have that common understanding, because right now, uh, all these things are very technical. Remember, we've lowered uh, uh, tariffs on the continent, but all of a sudden, everything has become very technical. The language is very technical. So we have to break it down for our stakeholders, our policymakers, and also put it within our, our national quality policies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Information share, stakeholders engagement. This is very, very key. And the quality policy at the national level, how can we include the MRAs? That is also very key. Thank you, Dr. Eve. I will come back to you shortly uh, for, for a question that was asked by a participant. Uh, but I start with uh, uh, Mahmoud. Uh, there is a participant who wanted to know uh, one if for Ghana's if Ghana is uh, recognized by AFRAC, and, uh, and what is the difference between uh, uh, the membership status uh, in AFRAC? In uh, two minutes, please. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yes, um, just I, uh, thank you for the questions. I will uh, give um, short um, information about the AFRAC uh, membership to cover both questions. Uh, just uh, the first level uh, or the first category are those the arrangement members. We have six arrangement members. Arrangement members, those are the accreditation bodies, members who are evaluated by AFRAC according to 17 or 11, and they are recognized based on the decision and the outcome of evaluation. Those are six members. Uh, Ijaq Egypt, in now Ethiopia, Sana South Africa, Satkas, multi economy accreditation body, Kinas, Kenya, and Morutas and Mauritius. The full members, which are five members, those are accreditation body members, but they, they already accredit uh, mm -hmm. uh, some uh, conformity assessment body at the national level, but they are not being evaluated yet by. Uh, AFRAC to be recognized, or they are evaluated, but the decision has not been taken yet. So those are uh, five members, uh, Algirak, SWAT, uh, Ninas, Nigeria, Azdaq, Sudan, and Tuna. Then we have associate member, with, which is uh, another level, which this is Ghana, and this is, they have early stage of uh, system, and uh, they need to, uh, 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 complete their uh, their uh, 
capacity building to be a full member then to be uh, arrangement member. The uh, fourth category is the stakeholders. We have 13 stakeholders. Those are not an accreditation body, but those are organization that have uh, interest in accreditation like associations or any uh, uh, organization that have uh, interest in accreditation. So Ghana is only an associate member. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Martin, I, one question that I feel I di direct to you from a participant was um, how does uh, your body as an example work with the third party uh, inspection bodies such as SGS? Uh, thank you very much for that question. Um, Kenas, um, Sanas, uh, are accreditation bodies. Uh, I talked about the added layer of assurance. So if you look at the hierarchy, um, at the, in terms of uh, the chain of confidence, at the highest level is an accreditation body. The role of an accreditation body is to assess and accredit uh, an inspection body, such as SGS, which is third party inspection, uh, a certification body, uh, a testing laboratory, a medical testing laboratory, a calibration laboratory, a verification body. So that's second layer. So in the chain of confidence, it is the highest accreditation is different from a third party inspection. So we provide you, the consumer, we provide the businesses with the decision criteria or justify for them that you may use this inspection body because they are accredited. I think I will leave it at that. Yeah, thank you very much, Marty. Mokai, uh, one question that I feel I direct to you is uh, that um, Dr. Mokai, uh, someone asked it, can the mutual recognition arrangement work without harmonized uh, product standards? Yes, um, <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Hemogin. Um, the, the basic um, point is that we have done, I think, a lot of work in the area of harmonization of standards, whether they're product standards or, you know, other, you know, uh, areas. And um, we have seen that, you know, unfortunately that has not been adequate. And this is why we have taken a step further by then bringing in other instruments that are embodied in the SPS and uh, TBT, you know, uh, agreements as trade facilitation tools, because, you know, at the end of the day, it's about trade facilitation. And, you know, when we look at um, the pilot that we carried out was on maize, obviously we were using EAC standards, you know, for maize. You cannot run away from that. But then the problem that most countries continue to face and most, you know, exporters, you know, from the region uh, are these other issues apart from, you know, uh, standards. The issues with respect to conformity assessment, the issues with respect to you know, the standard operating procedures that are not existent, uh, especially uh, those, you know, risk-based approaches, is, you know, at the borders or ever, anywhere else, at any points or, uh, you know, ports of entries. So this, this really is, is the crux of the matter. Indeed, you know, um, it's not easy to um, uh, implement mutual recognition uh, arrangements, agreements, uh, frameworks, uh, in a vacuum without, you know, harmonized standards. That, you know, I do agree is a necessity. But what I'm saying is that in addition to those harmonized standards, we need to go one step further. And that is the issue of our MRIs. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, meaning harmonized standards are necessary, but to implement them, we need to have also to work on conformity assessment issues, to uh, towards mutual recognition uh, arrangement. Thank you, Dr. Musawa. Okay.
Ev, Dr. Ev Gazipa, someone asked, what is your strategy of involving the private sector, the, the, the players in all this quality infrastructure activity? What's the strategy you can advise us? Okay, uh, thank you uh, very much for that question. Um, I think this question came from Zakaria. Yes. What I believe is that for trade to take place, uh, Dr. Hibogen, for trade to take place in any country, there needs to be a recognition of the existence of different stakeholders who play different mandates. For instance, um, governments, governments, what are they there for? They are there to develop national quality policies, uh, MRAs, regulations. Private sector players, what are they there for? They are producing different products and implementing standards. They're dealing with TBTs, they're dealing with SPS issues. Um, and, and national standards bodies, what are we doing? We are, we are busy making standards, we're harmonizing them, we are implementing the um, various uh, conformity assessment regimes, we're providing the PTs, et cetera. So to answer you directly now, once we've identified those uh, different groups of stakeholders, we need to engage them. You know, I think now is the time because since the 1st of uh, January, the AFCFTA is now fully operational. What it means is that the information needs to get out there. And, and as I think as national standards bodies and uh, champions of the MRA, uh, our role is really to, to help to, to, de to demystify, to, to unpack all of these things. Imagine how complicated it is for us to understand it. What about somebody who is um, producing, a, a, I would say, peanuts somewhere there in the village, or they are doing uh, oranges? You really need to sit down with them and help them understand. And I think um, maybe the last issue is, uh, as we are implementing our AFCFTA, we, we can as well identify those uh, types of um, challenges which our export markets are, 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 you know, what we have been subjected to. For instance, uh, I, I mentioned some of the export markets for Zimbabwe. Do we really understand what their requirements are? And um, how can we leverage our MRAs? I think these are the real issues now. I think we have to move to, to this um, next level, Dr. Himojin, where we should um, less talk, but more action. To, to, to make it really a reality, we cannot generate the forex that we need. Thank you. Uh, uh, lastly, in concluding, uh, what is your takeaway message? I start from you, Dr. A. One, one takeaway message that you can give to participants. Message. You want to? Okay, my takeaway message is that um, I think as um, uh, technical people who are used to being very technical, let's let's try and be less technical, and 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 uh, bridge the information gap to our stakeholders. That is the message. Thank you, thank you very much, Doctor Musarwa. What is the takeaway message you can give? Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Um, uh, from, from, from our side, I think the, we, we need to um, really unpack and embrace the issue of mutual recognition uh, agreements uh, as a serious trade facilitation tool. We really, as I've said earlier on, done a lot of work on uh, standard normalization and a lot of resources have gone into that but we have not seen enough adequate resources going into the areas of MRAs and, and uh, really unpacking the potential that lies you know, uh, with them. And this also really uh, uh, um, uh, relates to the politicians. I think we need to bring them in. It has so far been uh, restricted to us, you know, the technocrats, but let's bring in the you know, politicians so that they see the value that MRIs have in terms of uh, expanding trade opportunities amongst our countries across the continent. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Martin, Jasiri, what is the takeaway message? 
Um, thank you very much uh, for having me. And uh, my takeaway message is perhaps towards the orientation of the regulators. The regulators are the ones who uh, have um, limited trust that if they don't put a rule out there, uh, then things will go bad, uh, a, a sense of fear. Um, we've seen in the last one year that some regulators were investing in both them prescribing the regulation and also investing in facilities and such as uh, a, test, a test house have ceased and given the private sector to actually run a test house based on accreditation. So the message is we need to have more conversation with regulators, show them test cases where standards are referenced, so they don't need to write the standards, where accreditation is used and referenced uh, in regulation, and that gives the opportunity for them to have access to broader uh, available, available conformity and services. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Uh, Mahmoud, what is the takeaway message? Yeah, I see that it's important uh, for all parties to uh, keep efforts, to keep um, making a lot of efforts uh, to promote and implement uh, a track arrangement uh, in order to enhance trade. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, in summary, some key recommendation that um, uh, came out apart from the takeaway message that you had. Well, one key issue that really came out is that um, MRA should be uh, really given a priority. Uh, uh, first of all, looking at why those MRA, existing MRA didn't work, uh, but now uh, linked to uh, priority sector for as a trade facilitation tool. That is one. Secondly, uh, to focus and to see how we can encourage multi-economy accreditation uh, systems on our continent. Uh, that can be also uh, helping the trade facilitation within the CFTA. A third, uh, to look at uh, the, the MRAs as actually a tool for implementation of harmonized standard that link to export market. The export market, the well-traded product that we have uh, on our continent and uh, at national level. Uh, information sharing uh, with private sector, but also uh, engage also the regulators. That's also come as a, a very big recommendation. Uh, next recommendation, is on uh, a quality policy, national quality policy that should be comprehensive and actually include the MRA issues. Uh, those are the key recommendations from uh, this webinar. Uh, I thank you uh, very much uh, for participating to this webinar. Uh, being with us throughout uh, the webinar. I thank our speakers, uh, Mahmoud, uh, Tiab. Thank you very much uh, for presenting. Uh, I thank uh, Martin Chesire. Thank you very much. Uh, I thank Dr. Ev uh, Gadzikwa. Thank you very much for your presentation. I thank Dr. Mukai Musarwa. Uh, thank you very much for all your presentation. I uh, look forward for our next webinar, uh, which is uh, again next month. Uh, we will also focus more on uh, uh, SMEs, uh, looking at um, uh, fostering the small and medium-sized enterprises, trade competitiveness through standardization helping SMEs to be an engine of trade growth and employment under the AFCFTA and the role of uh, ARZO. Uh, some of the key speakers we will also learn from uh, the European Union uh, on the role of standard helping the SMEs. And we will also share with you other key speakers that will be part of us. Thank you very much. I look forward to see you on 23rd September uh, next month. Thank you and uh, have a nice day. Yeah.
Bye. Bye, Dr. Himojin. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Himojin. Thank Bye you. you. Thank you, sir. So. Bye, colleagues. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.